thing about overall ecosystem health and how, how water quality affects it, uh, first thing to understand is that ecosystems are very dynamic. They're changing all the time, they're changing over seasons, they're changing within a season. But over time what, what you'll find is that if, if a system is stressed for long enough, either because it has too much of something or too little of something, or something else is coming in and competing with it, you know, back to, the, back to your yard, if it's dandelions that are competing with your grass, you're going to see a shift over time in how that system is functioning. In the case of a, you know, a natural system that's been influ influenced by humans, whether that's because the amount of water it's receiving has changed or the, uh, the nutrients it's receiving or maybe the amount of pollution it's receiving have changed, over time those are eventually either going to promote growth and, and health of that system or a decline in the system. Something very, uh, very dramatic like an oil spill or something can have a very very immediate impact, but something more gradual, like a gradual change in the amount of fertilizer that's, that's making its way into a water body may, uh, may just slowly degrade that system. You need to understand what the problem is first, and, and then you also need to understand maybe how, it, how the system works without those impacts and try and move it back toward that as much as possible. We bring together a lot of different things like climate information, land management information, um, and the outputs can actually be put right into a lake model that would be able to, to look at some of the problems inside Lake Erie. The main factors leading to algal blooms are similar to any type of, of uh, occurrence or growth of a plant. Uh, even the different types of algae aren't exactly the same as, as corn or, or an oak tree. Uh, you need all the things that you need for a plant. You need it to be warm enough. You need it to have uh, fertilizer. Uh, there needs to be sunlight for it to grow. And so uh, if those occur in the right combination, you get the kind of growth that you want. Harmful algal blooms in Western Lake Erie have many different contributing factors, and some of them we're not even sure if they contribute, but we hypothesize they might. The harmful algae blooms were not a big problem a decade ago, but now, today, they are a big problem. Even if you had the same climate and the same phosphorus load this year as you did 10 years ago, you might see a larger bloom because the lake is just it's very susceptible right now to these algae blooms. And so there are questions about whether the invasion of quagga mussels might be contributing to the algae bloom. These little mussels sit all over around in the lake and filter the water, and they may preferentially filter out the other algae, but let the harmful algae um, grow in abundance. A lot of our work um, is looking at how farming activities affect water quality downstream, and farming activities, while very beneficial for producing the products that we need, can have some consequences, negative consequences downstream. One of the main drivers of the size of the harmful algal bloom every year is the phosphorus load from the Maumee River, which feeds the algae. The algae in the Great Lakes love phosphorus, and that comes from fertilizers and manures and heavily agricultural watersheds. Another important nutrient for the blooms is probably nitrogen, and there is some speculation about whether the amount of nitrogen also coming from farm fertilizers might be affecting the, the way that the algae grow and which species they are, perhaps, or how toxic they are. The particular kind in Lake Erie, cyanobacteria, have a toxin um, called microcystin, and that toxin is not good for people, animals, or ecosystems. The actual distribution of fertilizer on the landscape is pretty consistent, but uh, what changes the most is the delivery. So in a very wet year, particularly a wet spring, there's a lot more material that gets washed uh, into the lake, washed into the rivers and into the lake, either as particles or dissolved uh, to kind of fuel that, that uh, algal bloom. Whereas in a dry year, uh, the light is there, it's warm enough, those two factors are, are present, but you don't have the fertilizer to drive it, and so there's only so much food uh, to grow that algae crop. Another contributor that's very important for these harmful algal blooms and how large they are each year is climate. It, climate impacts how much phosphorus gets there as well. So climate is a real driver um, of, the, of the phosphorus loading to the lake. But climate is also a driver of the harmful algal bloom once it's forming in the lake. These um, algae have an optimal temperature that's warmer than many of the other types of algae. And so if you have a hot summer, 
you might have a longer season for these algal blooms, or the harmful algae might outcompete the other algae in the system. And so climate, temperature, and precipitation are very important for the year-to-year the -year variability that you would see in the algae blooms. We can't control the weather, but we can possibly control some of the things that we do uh, within the watershed that then influence the quality of the river water, which in turn influences the quality of the lake water. And all of those would be things that are related to reducing nutrients, whether that's different types of crops, uh, different ways of tilling the soil, different ways of managing the drainage of the water through the fields and through the ditches, uh, increasing some of the natural ability of those watersheds to absorb some of the nutrients with uh, uh, restoring wetland habitat, et cetera, those sorts of practices, things that will will uh, will influence the you know the the parts of the system that we actually have some control over. An algal bloom event is a negative event. It pollutes the water, it closes beaches, it makes the you know it may affect wildlife in the lakes. Uh, you want to build the capacity of cities and other uh, decision makers to prevent that that happens. And understanding the causes of algal bloom will be part of building that capacity. If you have an idea of when it might happen, you can take measures that will possibly prevent it. We design these scenarios to test for the future and what that might look like is farmers fertilizing less or applying manures at a different time or tilling the field in a different way, those sorts of scenarios, or possibly restoring wetlands and buffers uh, along waterways. And we'll test those scenarios and then we have those output and we can share and we can say maybe we can restore this watershed and this is what it would take. One thing that one of our collaborators does that we think is really interesting is she actually brings farmers on tours, on sailing tours of the Maumee Bay and uh, see, they can see the harmful algae bloom right there. And I think that's a great way to help people to see what's happening that they might not realize that their farm might influence um, they might not even see it. It might be just something that, that they hear about. But to actually go and see is just such an interesting experience. And she finds that these farmers, after seeing the problems in Lake Erie, are really motivated to go back and talk with neighbors and create um, networks of, of farmers to try to deal with some of these problems. One way that climate change as a problem is evolving, especially in the Great Lakes region, is that everybody is very concerned about how slow and fast extreme events that may be caused by climate change will affect the resources that we care about, water quality, you know, wildlife, forests, etc. So um, one, one advice or one way that science can inform what to do is first of all by forecasting, by predicting what's going to happen. And when you predict with when something or when you project what is going to happen, people can start uh, making decisions about it. Another way that you can do that, you can focus on what can be done now. It's what we call no non-regrets um, decision making. What this means is basically doing what you know it's right, no matter what happens in the future. So we know that clean water is better than polluted water. So irrespective of what happens with climate change, we know that it's better to do something to clean our waters right now. So one example on how science helps people to build capacity is that by uh, both educating a lot of people about the problem of climate change so that public opinion supports action in climate change. So this is one way in which science can help. And another way is by understanding these relationships, these causal effect relationships, so that it becomes easier for decision makers to know what to do when time comes or prevent uh, uh, you know, a negative outcome uh, beforehand.